My name is Trent Stubbs. I'm a rising senior undergraduate student at Furman University, and I've been working under the direction of Dr. Greg Springsteen for the past two summers at a part of uh, NASA and NSS-funded Center for Chemical Evolution. So I would like to start today by uh, discussing the classic Miller-Urey experiment done in the 1950s. It's really launched the field of prebiotic chemistry, of course, by demonstrating being able to transform these small organic materials into larger biologically relevant species like amino acids. Two other um, some more related experiments being formaldehyde condensation, producing saccharides or HCN polymerization and hydrolysis, generating a lot of precursors to nucleobases. Um, but as you can tell from the two HPLC chromatograms, there was no thermodynamic end product to these processes. And it's hard to imagine that biology could then take this system, which is somewhat of an organic tar-like mess, and be able to evolve from it in, as some sort of established foundation. So when we were designing our experiments to investigate the origins of metabolism, we wanted something a little bit more robust. And so we wanted to study something that exists in every living system ever, and that is the citric acid cycle. Um, these transformations now ha have many roles in modern biology, three of which are to capture redox potential, biosynthesize other relevant molecules, and then fixate carbon in the form of the reductive citric acid cycle. Now, these specific transformations to turn pyruvate and acetyl-CoA into these larger building block intermediates require 11 different enzymes and multiple cofactors, including NAD+, FAD, and GDP. But, um, but of course, we were just looking more for a, a, some sort of remnant of these robust geochemical pathways that existed within. And many researchers before have tried to recapitulate these exact transformations that occur within the citric acid cycle, and only two of which really proceed in high yield. That's the oxidative decarboxylation and the beta decarboxylation. And, and it makes very good sense for why these transformations don't occur. The carboxylate is just simply not reactive enough. The carbonyl carbon um, is not electrophilic enough for attack, and then the carbon alpha to the carboxylate has a pKa of about 27. So it's just not something that is nucleophilic enough to be able to establish an, an appreciable equilibrium between the carboxylate and the either enol or enolate to attack out of. So we had an idea and that was to replace this carboxylate functional group with something more reactive. And that more reactive group turns out to be something called an alpha keto acid, and it's shown below on, on the, um, the bottom half of the screen. And these alpha keto acids are much more electrophilic at that carbonyl carbon and are susceptible to attack, and they're much more nucleophilic. That alpha carbon next to the keto acid has a pKa of about 12. So now in an aqueous environment, we can begin to deprotonating and start form a, the enol or enolate to attack out of as a good nucleophile. And somewhat remarkably, the, this alpha keto acid can then be transformed right back into the canonical carboxylic acid in near quantitative yield just through the oxidative decarboxylation. So our idea was to take the citric acid cycle, something robust in every biological system that exists, and replace one of those carboxylate functional groups with this more reactive alpha keto acid functional group. And that's shown on the second line. So for example, malate becomes now maloyl formate, or fumarate becomes fumaroyl formate. And you may even see that some keto acids exist now already in the citric acid cycle, uh, like alpha ketoglutarate and oxaloacetate. And here's just an example of one reference in the literature right now utilizing the power of these alpha keto acids. Uh, this was done by Kim et al. Um, in the 70s, where they were able to show the generation of citrate through a, a um, self-condensation of oxaloacetate followed by beta decarboxylation and then oxidative decarboxylation to get reasonable yields in the aqueous environment at, at a pH of 5 and pH of 7. We wanted to test our prebiotic pathway and so we did that by reacting 200 millimolar pyruvate with three equivalents of glyoxylate and a pH 7 buffer. And that gave us these first, um, these two NMRs shown. And, and it was somewhat remarkable in that not only did we see the first aldol addition product, that maloyl formate species, but we also saw the condensation product and then reduction product and then subsequent aldol addition and condensation product as well. And this was really exciting for us. And that's what the, um, both NMRs are showing us uh, A being starting from pyruvate and then B starting from alpha ketoglutarate, where nearly everything we produced in solution was one of these citric acid cycle equivalents, right? Just with the alpha keto acid functional group. 
And then from there, we wanted to transform this keto acid group back into the carboxylate functional group. And we did that just through the oxidative, decarboxylate, uh, oxidative decarboxylation mechanism with five equivalents of hydrogen peroxide just at room temperature. And in mere 15 minutes, it, it gave us this beautiful spectra below where now everything in solution is now these citric acid cycle intermediates. And this all stemmed from a single reaction pot, a single system of just pyruvate and glyoxylate, the smallest alpha keto acid and the second smallest alpha keto acid. Another way which we were able to visualize this reaction progression was by HPLC. So two of the molecules in particular having a double bond really have a nice UV trace, one being the fumaroyl formate labeled B and the other being a conatoyl formate labeled C. So as we see that concentration of fumaroyl formate increase as we begin to go through the cycle, we then see it reach its maxima and then start to fall as the concentration of the transaconitate begins to increase. So this was a beautiful pathway to really show that we were following this, this cyclic system like that of the reductor reductive citric acid cycle. And we believe that that transformation from B, uh, the fumarole formate, to the alpha ketoglutarate is the rate limiting step. And it, it is presumed that that might proceed through a Conazaro type reduction of a hydride through the hydrate of glyoxylate. Additionally, this helped us visualize that we were also producing um, some cis aconitate, which is the biologically relevant isomer of aconitate. And so this is the pathway in a nutshell, the outer cycle being the modern reductive citric acid cycle, and the inner cycle being our keto acid equivalent pathway, starting from pyruvate and glyoxylate, proceeding through the exact, inter the exact equivalent of the intermediates in the citric acid cycle in a single um, reaction pot, a single reaction system at a pH of 7 and 50 degrees C in, in only 21 hours. Now, you may see the one gap in between the aconitoyl formate and citroyl formate. That's one area in which we wanted to investigate in the future. And we have now an idea for being able to transform that molecule, the um, medial aconitoyl formate, we call it, into the citroyl formate. If medial conatoyl formate just hydrates in water, it would be a conjugate addition and it would add um, not at the tertiary carbon, which is, would give us the citroyl formate. So we need to somewhat rearrange this keto acid functional group. And we found that while taking an NMR of this species, we would exchange uh, protons with the deuterium in D2O um, at the beta carbon, which would suggest we somehow activated that beta carbon. And when you look at the structures, and particularly the resonance structures of that species, it makes sense why that carbon was activated. It's now dumping into the carboxylate adjacent to it, and then through the double bond into another carboxylate as well. So in theory, now we can add a second equivalent of glyoxylate, add at the beta position, and then hydrate and retroaldol that first glyoxylate addition, giving us now terminal aconitoyl formate, same molecule just having that uh, sorry, the keto acid functional group in a different location. This would then uh, hydrate in the tertiary position, we believe, which would retroaldol, giving us two molecules of pyruvate and, and one molecule of carbon dioxide. So if we can achieve this transformation now in the future, that would have taken us from one pyruvate starting the cycle to two pyruvates and an excess of glyoxylate. Uh, something else we wanted to demonstrate was well, how far can we take these alpha keto acids? How much can we utilize their reactiveness? And, and we wanted to generate some amino acids, much like biology does with them now. And so we did that through a transamination with the simplest amino acid, glycine, and a potassium aluminum salt at 80 degrees C and a pH of 5 for about 5 hours. And NMRA showing the generation of glutamate from alpha ketoglutarate, and then B showing the generation of alanine from pyruvate in the presence of the glyoxylate and this potassium aluminum salt. And then now somewhat interestingly as well, um, the uh, glycine species then is also it's undergoing that transamination. So it is producing glyoxylate, which is the feedstock for our prebiotic cycle as shown on the previous slide. And so just uh, one more time, just to kind of wrap up everything that was done on this project, um, the inner cycle being our alpha keto acid equivalent and the outer cycle being the canonical citric acid cycle. And, and a couple uh, key points I want to emphasize are 
we're not suggesting that it was hydrogen peroxide or a potassium aluminum salt which underdid these exact transformations. But what we're trying to show is that going from these keto acids to the canonical carboxylates or to amino acids would have been really easy and really efficient and even advantageous for an evolving enzymatic system to, to, um, to use once it requires regulation. Because once we get the canonical citric acid cycle intermediates, as I showed on, I think, slide two, they're dead ends, and we can't undergo any further transformations unless we have that enzyme. So we, we can imagine this as, as a possible prebiotically plausible um, um, system for now an evolving enzyme to really get a hold of and grasp and begin to transform and evolve. Uh, so with that, I would just like to thank uh, everyone who helped support this project, Furman University and the Furman Advantage for funding my summer research experience, NASA and the NSF for funding the Center for Chemical Evolution, uh, the Scripps Research Institute, specifically the lab of Dr. Ram Krishnamurthy for all their help on collaboration on this product, and lastly, uh, my lab members, Alyssa Clay, who's now at Stanford, uh, Rachel Cook, who will be giving a poster presentation tonight at 7, and my PI and, and mentor, Dr. Greg Springsteen. So with that, thank you so much much for your attention. I'd be happy to take any questions. So we have time for questions. If you just yeah, stand up yeah, just and stand up ask. Great, yeah. <laughs> great job. Right. Thank you. Um, so if you are getting that reduction of the humor oil, humorate to alpha keep blue ray, right? Yes. Yes. Right. So we do see some oxalate in the NMR. And um, particularly, we believe there are a couple of competing pathways which might um, uh, produce this, um, the uh, alpha ketoglutarate. Uh, another one being through a, a second addition of glyoxalate. But that's something we're still investigating and wanting to look down the road to really confirm that, particularly with some isotopic labeling studies, though. Yes, I, I think uh, it's, it's a great question. I think that's one of the, the strongest points we have uh, for this prebiotic cycle is that it, it runs by itself. And therefore, for some sort of living system, there would be no regulation and there would be no control over what's occurring. It can just go in water by itself, pretty remarkable. So then once the enzyme catalysis were available, it could really kind of capture it and get a hold of what was going on. So take away the reaction. That's exactly right. Yes. We can, yeah, we can make that a quick one. Uh, do you have any, I'm holding back on Tony's question. Uh, so do you have any ideas how those two cycles are separated from each other in energy space? So what does it take to go from one cycle? Um, so right now, that, that's just an oxidative decarboxylation mechanism. And the, currently, the, the, uh, the cofactor to do that is TPP. But, um, we can do that with hydrogen peroxide, which is just the byproduct of the photooxidation of water. Okay, all right. Thank you, Trent. Thank you.